Evening, ladies and gents. It's Simon Brown here. As always, this evening we're doing uh, blue chip stocks and how to identify them. Blue chips often a, a word bandied around that 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 doesn't means different things to different people. So I thought, well, first of all, let's go and get a definition. Um, New York Stock Exchange says it's a company that has a national reputation for quality, reliability, and I think most importantly, the ability to operate profitably, profitably in good times and bad. And that to me is one of the key things. Companies that make money when times are tough and perhaps make better money when times are good. It's that almost non-cyclical nature of it. Almost everything cyclical to a degree. You're going to go through good times and bad, but you want those bad times to not be uh, overly bad. Let's take an example of, of Anglo-America. You had to cut a dividend they've been paying for over 70 years during the crisis of 08, 09. Um, profits absolutely collapsed construction companies. We're seeing it at the moment where they, their profits are still under pressure and a number of them are actually turning into a loss. So it's that profitability. Uh, another definition which I got from Investopedia.com, um, again, nationally recognized, well established, financially sound. Uh, financially sound would be balance sheets, income statements, uh, not too much debt, good uh, uh, cash on hand, low debt equity ratios generally selling high quality, widely accepted products and services. I'm going to come back to that widely accepted products and services because for me that's a critical component which they gloss over. And they go on to say, known to weather downturns and operate profitably in the face of adverse economic conditions, uh, contributing to long record of stable and reliable growth. Um, and again, it comes back to that they're doing well in good times and bad. In good times, yep, they're going to be doing better, make no bones about it, but in bad times, they're still there, they're still making a profit when times are tough, when, when times are, are yeah, it, 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 yeah, and even if we go to the 08, 09 crisis, and some of the blue chips I'm going to pull out this evening certainly qualify as they were still making a profit in those times and doing, doing well cons compared perhaps to some of the other peers on the listed exchange. So, I would add to it, um, they have a moat. What do I mean by a moat? This is a, a phrase from, from Warren Buffett. And, and a moat is, is, uh, makes it difficult for competitors to enter their space. In other words, someone can't just come along and, and set up. If, if you're selling hot dogs on the street corner, it's very easy for your neighbor to come and sell hot dogs next to you and undercut your price. He just goes and buys some hot dog rolls and sausages and, and, and charges a little bit less and has a table and an umbrella and not much moat. A moat would be, for example, Coca-Cola's moat is the brand. Um, you have a moat in, in, in our banks. Our, our big banks have a moat in terms of branches, in terms of, of uh, the, the, the branding, the strength of their brand. Standard Bank, Absin, NetBank, uh, First National, we know those brands. The banks also have moats in terms of banking licenses. If I wanted to go and get a banking license, it's a lot, lot harder to it. If we look at mining, uh, moats are a whole lot more difficult. A couple of problems there. I mean, one, look at the Kumba Iron Ore Session Crown, Imperial Crown Trading Arsenal Metal Disaster. Um, suddenly, where's your moat in that space? Essential product. This was the point I wanted to come back to. What do I mean by essential product? <clears throat> Really what I'm looking for is something which we have to have. Uh, and, and two examples from jump to mind. Food. We have to eat. Yes, we don't have to go to Woolies and buy their fancy sirloin steak. We can go to ShopRite and, and, and buy simple food. The point is we have to eat. And that's why I would say ShopRite would be blue chip. Woolies wouldn't necessarily be blue chip because people can shop down. When times get tough, you stop shopping at Woolies and you move down the chain to Spa, to Pick and Pay, to ShopRite. Uh, not really much else to go beyond ShopRite. Uh, there's Boxer and the like, but in, in, in the big space. When times get good, people are moving up. So ShopRite gets traffic in both directions. They get traffic coming to them in the downside, people are shopping down. They get traffic coming to them in the good times, people who are shop, shopping up. Um, banks. No one likes banks. Everyone thinks they overcharge us for their fees. Um, I'm probably right in that point. The thing is, everyone has a bank account. No, we probably have a number. You've got a current account. You might have a savings account. You've got a home loan. You might have an online share trading account. You might have a vehicle finance account. Yeah, we're up to four or five already. Uh, we all have them. We, we, we might not like them, but we need bank accounts. No one gets paid in cash these days. Salaries are deposited into your account. So that's what I mean by essential product is 
is iron ore an essential product? Yes, in construction. Could the planet continue without it? Sure, it wouldn't be a great planet, but it would move forward. So you know, food, uh, financial services at the basic end, certainly two of those potential modes, uh, essential products. Another example of a moat would be SAB, uh, and I'm going way back into the 90s now, when their moat was their distribution network in South Africa. It wasn't so much that they necessarily had the best beer, it's that wherever you went in South Africa, any bottle store, any bar, any hotel, any shabine, any restaurant, they sold SAB product. And that, in many senses, was their moat, was that fleet of trucks that moved things. And I must say, I had SAB as a, as a blue chip, and I sold it when they went international and moved into the U.S. because I thought, hang on, they're going into the U.S. They, they're diluting their moat, which is a distribution network in South Africa. And the U.S. wasn't great for them, but broadly, SAB succeeded, I think, beyond many people's wildest dreams. So that wasn't the best of exits. But hey, that happens. That's trading. Uh, typically, you're looking at long-term buy and hold investments. Blue chips are stocks that I put in what I call my until death do us part portfolio. In other words, shares I hope to own until I die or they die. Um, and, and, and I really I, I want to hold them through the cycles. Uh, with that said, if they're going to be long-term investments, dividends are important. And there's a couple of points on dividends. One, that they pay them. Two, that they're relatively generous on them. And three, that as far as possible, they don't cut them when times get tough, that they rather change the dividend cover, that they rather eat into their, into, their, into their cash on hand a little bit to maintain that dividend payment. And again, we've seen it, uh, ABSA and NetBank both cut dividends. So this year, with results that came out for the six months to end June, they were both able to push their dividends higher. Standard Bank didn't cut their dividend during the crisis, so for the six months to June 2011, they didn't increase their dividend, they kept, kept it flat. Now, probably if you take the entire cycle, you're probably net-net flat. In other words, the cut of dividends is offset by the lack of increase, etc. But I like that consistency to a degree. I want that, I like that, that level of certainty. It's not a guarantee, but it's a level of certainty. And then because your moat is important, your product is important, your dividend, you hold them for a long term, management becomes absolutely critical. I, uh, Wati Bassan at ShopRite, absolutely top, top management. Uh, someone was asking me today if I'm worried about Walmart, and I said, you know what, I think Wati Bassan might have a few lessons to teach Walmart rather than Walmart teaching ShopRite. So management important. Management, of course, very esoteric. Keith McCluskin did a webinar on management. You can go and find it on the website, Just One Lap, um, where he looks at management. It's not the easiest thing in the world to do, um, to rate the management, but certainly people like Jacques Murray, people like Whitey Besson have built a good track record. The question then comes when Jacques Murray leaves Standard Bank and uh, probably Sim Shabalala becomes the new CEO, then what? Now, I'm going to say we certainly give Sim Shabalala the benefit of the doubt. We see if he can do it. He's been schooled by Jacko. He's come up through the ranks he, and under Jacko. But uh, certainly, I think management is critically important. So to add a little more, what are we looking for? To me, they've got to be big companies. They've got to be giants. They've got to be top 40 companies. So uh, top 40 company probably puts them at a market cap north of 30 or 40 billion rand in the South African environment as we sit here. And that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for those, those, those giant players. Will small companies become blue chips? Maybe. The truth of the matter is the vast majority won't. I would, in the South African market, maybe we've got a half dozen, maybe a dozen blue chips out of 400 odd shares. The majority never become blue chips to my mind. As I said, consistent dividend payer, and ideally I want them to not be reducing dividends. And that shows conviction by management going forward. It also gives me income during the tough times that I can go and invest elsewhere or back into the company. Um, so that dividend to me is very important. Strong, stable earnings. We've alluded to that already this evening. I appreciate that in the tough times, earnings are going to be under pressure, but I want them to be broadly there. I want them to be growth. And what I would really like to see, and, and in the example I come up later, is where, frankly, revenue grows regardless. Product and demand. What I mean by product and demand, again, it comes back to food. Again, it comes back to banking, which, which might be a grudge purchase, but it's still a purchase we're constantly making. Um, I, I, don't, I want products which are not easy to substitute. Is it easy to substitute iron ore? Sure. You go and buy your iron ore from Brazil instead of, instead of Kumba in South Africa. Is it easy to substitute banking services? 
No, you need a South African bank. Uh, sure, we've got Capitec on the horizon. We've got Investec as, as number five. Um, but let's be frank, there are not many new banks in, in, in the space that are up and coming and that, 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 you know, in the last decade or two. Um, food, product and demand, yes, we have to eat. We can eat different ways. We can eat at different price points. But absolutely, we have to eat. And then again, it comes back to that moat. I want them dominant in their space. I want them to, to they, they'll probably have competitors. That's fine. Competition isn't a bad thing. If anything, I think competition is good for consumers, which is, it is by proxy good for the companies. But I want that moat. I want that domination in terms of their product. So some examples would be the big four banks. I think Standard Bank and F&B, probably the preference, and, and in truth to me, it's Standard Bank and, and uh, disclaimer, that's the stock that I hold in the banking space. Well, Capitec too, but that's not a blue chip. Um, it would be the retailers. And again, in that space of retailers, I think it's very much uh, ShopRite. I'll be honest, I used to think it was pick and pay. Even before their trouble started, I switched to ShopRite. I ran the numbers a, a couple of years ago, maybe 2005. ShopRite was the best performing share in the stock market over the previous 30 years. It had returned 30% per year compounded. It is a, an astounding return. Will it do it going forward? Frankly, probably not. But it's certainly dominant and it fits with the space. Your diversified industrials, Bidvest, Barlow World. This is very much a classic concept behind the blue chip uh, definition. I'm not convinced. They, they're a little more cyclical. I suppose it depends the spaces that they're in. You know, if you're selling Caterpillar and yellow equipment, well, then when construction and mining takes a hit, that part of the world is going to fall out of bed. They've got uh, tourism. That's absolutely not uh, uh, completely critical um, and in demand. So I, I'm not convinced by the diversified because of that diversified nature of them. And then the food manufacturers as opposed to the retailers. A couple in South Africa, Tiger Brands, Pioneer and a few others. Um, Tiger Brands, probably the pick of the bunch, although certainly I don't have any food producers in, in my portfolio. I'm very much skewed towards ShopRite, towards Standard Bank. Others out there which have been flung out, folks will say to you, MTN. Uh, yes, no, maybe. I, I'm not convinced by... I, I think when we see the evolution of, of mobile down the line, where it's going to be about data more than anything, where it's going to be tiny margins and probably significantly good dividend players, it might move into that space. The problem right now is technology changes so fast. So, uh, LTE, 4G is coming out, um, and if you're behind the curve with that, you're really going to be in trouble. Uh, people have said Richmond. Do we really need to watch that costs a quarter of a million dollars or pounds or euros? Of course not. The flip side is, well, heck, the rich are so rich they can always afford it. Yeah, I'm not comfortable in that space, so I, I, I'm not a fan. Um, but we can run through some more stocks towards the end. Broadly, that's what I'm looking at. And my two picks in the JSC is Standard Bank and ShopRite. You might want to substitute F&B for Standard Bank. And if you want a little bit of... Um, braveness to you, you might want to put a pick and pay instead of a, 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 a shop right there. As I said, not blue chip, um, your mining stocks. They price takers, in other words, they've got no control over the price they charge. The market decides what gold or platinum or whatever the case is worth, and they just get that price. They have no, 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 no control over what they sell it for. And then, of course, increased competition. One of the biggest problems with commodities is that as the price goes up, everyone rushes out and produces more. Now, it's the same in soft commodities, such as wheat and, and, and maize. The thing is that if, if a farmer sees a really good price, they can very quickly um, come along and, and, and you know, for next year, they can up their, 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 their quota, their, their crop in the more expensive space. Um, in mining, it takes longer, but you see the demand in iron ore, suddenly we see capacity coming on stream. There's a lag four, five, seven years, but certainly make a mistake, it's there, it's going to be happening. TNT companies, uh, as I said, the trick there with TMT is again highly competitive, highly evolutionary. Apple's riding the wave at the moment, um, but what's going to happen when, when the new product comes out? And uh, what is that new product? I haven't a clue. If I did, I'd go work for Microsoft or maybe Apple. Um, you know, Ten years ago, Apple was bankrupt and it was all about Microsoft. And then it was Google, Facebook. 
uh, five years ago, it was all about MySpace, now it's all about Facebook. So I'm, I'm not a big fan of, of TMT. That's tech media, telecommunications. That would include, to my mind, the IT companies as well. It's too easy to get caught on the wrong side of that process. So let's quickly run through an example. Uh, ShopRite, as I said already, and right up front, disclaimer, I, I own ShopRite. I sold a little bit um, in their results in around March, but looking at the results that came out today, I'm hanging on. I'm very comfortable with them. Um, and in part, I sold them because I wanted to free up some cash, but uh, certainly I like them. What have you got with ShopRite? Dividend increases. And I think the dividend announced today was the 122nd dividend, which means they've been paying a dividend for over 60 years every single six months. As far back as my data goes, which is 1991, they have never cut a dividend. Heck, they've never even kept a dividend sideways. They have increased the dividend every year back to 1991. And, and there have been tough times. I mean, make no mistake about it. We've had recessions, we've had emerging market crises, we've had bull markets, and of course the global financial crisis of 2008-2009. They increased dividends. Revenue increases. Revenue just goes up, sometimes more modestly. This year, I think it was, what, 7-odd uh, percent revenue up, although there was an extra week in, in, in the previous year. But nonetheless, again, revenue increases. Again, I go back to 91. There it is. My revenue is increasing. My earnings are increasing. Again, every year, the headline earnings per share or earnings per share constantly goes up. It's always increasing. So what am I looking at here? And this data is easy to find. I mean, certainly uh, at, at my broker, I, I, you know, it's all there, and the data goes back to 91. It's easy to just haul out that particular information, um, quickly eyeball it. And what do you see? A stock that just goes up and up and up in terms of dividend, in terms of revenue, in terms of earnings. Debt equity fluctuates a bit. The return on, on, on equity fluctuates a bit, etc. But the key three metrics, revenue, earnings, and dividends, gone up every year for 20 years that I can measure. And 20 years is enough data for me. Do they have a moat? They do have a moat, but and Walmart will test that moat. I, 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 I'd, I'd say flippantly, Whitey Besson is going to teach Walmart about retailing, and I believe that. But make no mistake, ShopRite have got a, a fight on their hands. Um, what is their moat? It's brand, it's location, it's customer loyalty, it's price, it's all of those sort of things which are not insignificant. And what we're seeing with the ShopRite brand, which is ShopRite and Checkers and Hyperama, Hyperama or Hypermarket, I can never remember. What we're seeing is, is, is they cover the LSM space these days. They're right from the low LSMs all the way up to the high, from number one to number ten. Um, and they're constantly picking up market share. Now, we could argue that maybe part of that is that uh, pick and pay lost their way a bit, and I think it is. But frankly, looking at the numbers, I think they're picking up market share from uh, SPA. And more than that, I think they're picking up market share from Woolies, which is a, an astounding feat. So in a sense, that is their moat. Is it the most indefensible moat in the world? No, absolutely not. Um, but it's certainly there. And then, of course, their other moat, their their key defining point is people need to eat. And, and they're catering for that wider section. The, the whole checkers move into wide range of cheeses, uh, wine, etc. That's your mid to up LSMs. But at the same time, they've got their shop rights and in the checkers, but they're aiming at also the, the lower LSMs at the same time. Um, so aiming at a broad category, and we need to eat. As I said earlier, people are going to, in good times, people will move up through. Some people may leave for for Woolies, but a lot might stay. And in the bad times, people are going to leave Woolies and start shopping at the at the at the shop rights. So certainly they they fit those criteria to my mind. So the question then comes: Well, great. When do we buy them? Um, and Adrian Seville at, at the, uh, the the webinar he did for us for JC Power Hour of a couple of weeks ago made a great comment where he said um, it might be a great company but is it a great investment? Warren Buffett puts it another way, where he says, price is what you pay, value is what you get. And the question is really quite simple. Sure, you want to buy these companies, but you want to buy them when they are cheap. That's critically important. You don't want to buy them when they're expensive. Uh, ShopRite, uh, sort of at 100, 102 Rand, uh, is that cheap? No. It's sitting on a price earnings of around 20. It's sitting on a dividend yield of around 2.5. That's not particularly cheap. 
And how I define cheap, and I, I take it quite a simple process, is I use a PE range. Okay, we've, we've done a webinar on the PE ranges. You can go and find it on justonelap.com. And what I go and do is I go and plot 10 years of, of historic PE, and I find what is that price point, what is the low PE? And it's going to be different for different stocks. Um, if memory serves, and, and, and I honestly can't remember, so, so don't take me my word, go crunch the data. Um, ShopRite, a cheap PE on ShopRite is about 14. So you want to buy a ShopRite on that PE of around 14, which means at the moment it's expensive, which means, frankly, do you go and buy a ShopRite? My advice is no. Leave the money in your brokerage account, earn some interest, and wait for it to become cheap. The flip side of that, how long do you wait? And you might you might wait a long time. I mean, global financial crises of 08, 09 are, are brilliant for finding cheap. Uh, here's hoping we don't have another one anytime soon, but is ShopRite, if we want to buy it on a PE of, say, 14, we need it to get down into the high 60s or low 70s. And I've got to be honest, I don't see that happening to ShopRite in the next six months. So it, it's a really tough ask. My rule of thumb, and I have a, a mature portfolio, so perhaps that gives me a little more luxury of time, I say to myself, well, you know what, I can wait for cheap. I can outweight these guys, um, and, and opportunities will come along. Perhaps if you're starting a portfolio and you've, you've got a, a, a much smaller amount of money you'll be looking to, or small amount of money you'll be looking to put in, maybe it's the case of, well, okay, we need to get in. We need to get into the market. We're going to get paid the dividend yield of 2.5% per year. That constantly goes up. So maybe we don't have to wait till it's absolutely bare bones cheap. But certainly, I like to buy stocks when they, these sort of stocks, what I call my death to us part, the blue chips. I like to buy them with that, their low level of their PE ranges. And then the big question, when to sell? Typically, I don't sell these stocks. I, as I said, I sold some shop rights earlier in the year, um, and that was primarily I wanted to free up cash, and also shop rights had become to my mind, a little, my portfolio was overweight with ShopRite. Uh, ditto happened with Capitech, um, and that's simply because of how hard they had run in the preceding two years since sort of uh, first half of 2009 when I'd been doing a fair bit of buying. Um, so when to sell, when the moat weakens. Whatever it is that you decided that moat was, when it becomes under threat. And I wouldn't be so bold as to preempt it. Walmart might breach the moat. I'm not rushing out to sell. If we see Walmart is becoming a problem, then I'll look to sell, which means I'm never going to sell at the top. But heck, I'm never going to sell at the top anyway, so I'm comfortable with that. Earnings fall. If we see earnings under pressure, if we see things starting to go backwards, and that's why I switched out of pick and pay. The earnings hadn't yet started to fall, but what we did see was that the earnings were growing at a significantly slower rate than Spa and ShopRite and Woolies, who are their peers. Um, so it wasn't even a fall in that case, it was a, a going backwards. And maybe excused if, if globally related. And here I look at the banks. Standard Bank's earnings did fall, but I hung on to them. And in fact, I bought more in early 2009 simply because I'm like, okay, this is less about a Standard Bank issue, this is more about a global financial crisis that is painting Standard Bank with the same picture. And then a dividend cut. If that dividend was critical, if I saying that uh, the dividends is, is, is a line in the sand that I'm drawing, I want them to keep that dividend. And if they cut it, then I've got to say, well, that's almost like my moat being weakened. Something fundamentally has changed, um, and I've got to seriously review the situation as it stands. Selling is always the hard part. Buying is easy. Selling is significantly harder. My advice is typically don't be too quick or eager to sell. Yes, prices might go up and they might come down and they might come down a lot. Uh, you know, Standard Bank was 120 in 2007 and then dropped to 60. I held it the whole way and now it's back in the mid 90s. Um, but I hang on. If you try and sell at the top and buy at the bottom, we never time the top, we never time the bottom, we get tax hits. Nothing, nothing good about that at all. Risks. Well, absolutely no certainty, none whatsoever. Nothing is certain in the world, especially the stock markets. Obviously, new competition, uh, Walmart being a case in point, Capitec being a case in point to Standard Bank. Point being, Standard Bank's much broader than just banking. Uh, to retail, it's a lot of long-term loans, which Capitec's moving into. It's also a lot of uh, what they call their CIB, corporate investment banking. And then you can often wait years for it to become cheap, uh, and that's absolutely. You can wait a, a very, very long time for them to become cheap. 
and I suppose the risk is maybe they never become cheap. Uh, quick recap, blue chips, best of the best. They're never going to shoot the lights out. They're never going to do 100% in a year, but they're going to always be there. They're always going to be turning in. They're always going to be paying dividends for you. Over the long term, they're going to do very, very well for you. There are very few in the JAC, maybe half a dozen or so. I, I have two companies that I would out and out classify as blue chips, and that being Standard Bank and uh, ShopRite. Uh, and the best time to buy often when there is blood on the floor. And again, this is a Warren Buffett quote. The best time to buy in these stocks was early 2009 or late 2008. Uh, it wasn't easy. Everyone was telling you to run for the hills. Um, and, and further to that, if you're buying late in 2008, we had a rally in December and then it all collapsed again in the first quarter. So it's not an easy time to buy, but certainly to my mind, it's the best time to buy. Question from Pumlani. He's asking if it is viable to have a portfolio only of blue chips. Short answer, Pumlani, absolutely. Uh, I'm looking to get some presenters in to talk about portfolio construction, but a portfolio that was only of blue chips would be relatively defensive. It's never going to be a, a, a you know, knock the lights out style of portfolio, but certainly I, I wouldn't say that there's any problem with the portfolio of blue chips. I think many folks start with blue chips when they get into the stock market. Typically, they start with derivatives or small caps. I think blue chips is a much better place to start. And then Pumlani follows up in saying, so should he go and buy Standard Bank uh, and uh, uh, ShopRite tomorrow? And I'm going to answer it with uh, yes, no, maybe. And I'm going to tie in Harry's question. Harry says, what is a reasonable capital amount to start investing? Yeah, Pumlani, if you've got a million rand, I wouldn't go and buy the two tomorrow. If you had 10,000 rand, um, then sh well, and, and that's a skewed answer too because a million to somebody might be 10,000 to somebody else. Um, I wouldn't be adverse to buying either of them tomorrow. I think they will get cheaper in time, um, and that might be many years down the line. And by cheaper, I'm talking more about price earnings, but I don't think they're necessarily onerously expensive at the moment. Harry's asking a reasonable capital amount to start investing. Harry, it depends how you want to do it. I, I mean, 10,000 is a good number. I wouldn't look to do less than 5,000 Rand um, per transaction because costs start to hurt. Um, so if I had 5,000 Rand, then you can go and buy a share. That said, you could also start in the Satrix product or share builder with FMB or auto share invest with Standard Bank, which enable you to start investing from uh, as little as three or 500 Rand per month into either individual shares or basket shares. So I, I would, it depends if you've got a lump sum. Again, you can put a lump sum into Satrix for 1,000. I would say if you want to buy individual share via a traditional stock break of 5,000, if you want to go smaller amount, go direct to Satrix or the F&B share builder or the Standard Bank ASI. We did a, we did a, a webinar on how to buy shares and I covered the, the various different options in a lot more detail. Fumani is asking uh, if I know Satrix 40, would it be good to buy some of the shares that are there? Uh, short answer, yes. I mean, as, as a universe to invest in, Satrix 40, which is the top 40, is a good universe to invest in. And I mean that from two ways. One, to buy the Satrix 40. Uh, two, to start with that as your universe and to narrow it down from those 40 shares uh, to some that you might be interested in buying. So either to buy the basket or to use that as your start point, rather than starting with 400 shares on the JSC, you could just start with those 40 in the Satrix. Um, and, just, and, and, and dig around and find someone there to look to buy. Ladies and gents, I'm not seeing any more questions coming through, uh, and I've overrun my time by well, two minutes, but nonetheless, we'd like to try and keep it to at least 30 minutes, and I must say, I thought I'd maybe do this in about 20 minutes. I'm going to leave it there for this evening. Uh, thanks very much for attending. Hope you take something away from it, and perhaps one of the, the key points with blue chips that, that I didn't mention in the webinar, but I'll add in now, is again, it's about time and it's about patience. And I always say that the best asset for an investor is time. The more you have, the easier it is for two reasons. One, give your investments time to grow. Two, give you time to pick up great investments at great prices. Thanks very much for attending this evening. All the best.